minutes. All right. Well, what do you know, right? Is this something that is going to, um, you know, do you, you read one article and that seemed to tell you something like that? Or, you know. Welcome to the Financial Innovations Podcast, helping CFOs save money and time by investing in cutting edge tools. Really excited today to have Jeremy Jagernoff uh, with us. Jeremy, it's it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. So I, I know that you know data science and um, is is a very big area and topic of you know companies looking to invest. Thought you know, it would be great to have you on. And, you know, maybe if you want to just start by uh, introducing yourself, uh, you know, maybe talking a little bit about uh, your journey and, you know, how you got into the field. Sure, definitely. So my journey into data science was uh, a little different than most. Um, I think usually um, a data science professional has a computer science background, um, but I actually started off in biology, um, and I kind of went into biostatistics, and then from biostatistics, I went on to pursue a master's in applied statistics. Um, but kind of between the biology phase and the applied statistics phase, um, I was this was around 2009, 2010. I was really seeing a lot of trends with big data or get a lot of magazines coming into the house, MIT, Scientific America, Harvard Business Review. Um, and there were just a lot of the trends. I'm, I'm a big trend guy. I like, I like being on top of what's going to happen in the future. Nanotechnology was big. Biotechnology was big at that point in time. Still is. Um, but I saw this buzzword at the time, big data. And I didn't really understand what big data was. I was like, okay, it's data and it's a lot of data, but what exactly does that mean? I don't know. So time kind of went along and I had a minor in mathematics at that point. And um, my mom actually kind of enlightened me to say, hey, you could use your degree, your minor to pursue a master's in applied statistics. And then about that same time with my readings on the trends in big data, it became very clear that I could combine the two um, thought processes or two, two paths. And I, I could really use this mathematics interest and, and go down that path and potentially open up a whole new set of doors. Um, and that's exactly what happened. So after my master's in applied statistics, I ended up joining um, Delta Airlines um, and really working with them to analyze kind of my first analytical project, which was analyzing customer data um, and just mining texts. Um, and that was really interesting using um, SAS, uh, statistical analytical software, SAS, not SAAS. Um, but yeah, the applied statistics program kind of, we really leveraged SAS and R. Um, today it's a lot more Python, but SAS and R are still kind of my go to languages and tools that I use currently. But um, that the Delta experience was really the first one where I was able to leverage that skill set and analyze um, a lo over 100,000 comments and really understand that, okay, this market is talking about this specific topic and just clustering those comments. Um, and it actually had an action out of that. And the action was they changed the certain wine for a certain market. And they also changed the temperature on a certain food. So that was really um, impactful and, and great to hear. And my stay there was very short. And then I moved on into um, the credit space. I joined um, another company that's kind of like the Equifax for Italy, um, where they did a lot of uh, credit loss modeling. And I was more on the data management side. And so this is where. 
my um kind of my whole world evolved more into data asset management data management really data engineering those pieces um and i managed the attribute library for them that fed into the models and really building out all of the key um attributes that the models would use that were significant in the models whether it be delinquency attributes or charge-offs things like that um and that was using a proprietary software that they had built and they were kind of leveraging that analytical service to various companies that didn't necessarily have the um capital for an analytics team they kind of just um, branched out and had this company um, work and build those models for them so that they could get those same services. Yeah, I, I think that as we, you know, like like some of like my key takeaways and, you know, like what I kind of recommend to clients as well is, you know, just starting with a small use case, right? A lot of these big projects start off as just somebody on the side or a, gr- a small group of people on the side said, hey, how do we make the process better, right? And and you don't start by just trying to you know build something company wide. You say let's take one use case, let's see if this makes sense. You know, let's go off and you know and do it. Um, you know, uh, a point that I think is really important that you mentioned is you know when you start slicing off different data sets and taking subsets for here and there, it's very important to have that governance in place. To make sure, you know, is my data accurate in this, you know, data mart that that we built? Is it consistent with, you know, the other uh, supersets of data that we have out there? You know, so do you want to maybe just talk a little bit about like what are what are some of the things that you know that you had to do to make sure that you know, hey, we're taking this building off this small data mart. Like, what are you know? How do we make sure that? data is accurate, that, you know, it's consistent with everything, that we have those right checks and balances in place. Definitely. Um, So, yeah, we essentially they're controls in place. Um, And it's actually very basic controls. It wasn't clustering or building another model on top of the data to do data quality. Um, A big piece of it was, was do your downstream clients, your stakeholders, understand the checks and balances in place so you have to develop really simple things and one of i'll explain two of them um and then we can dive into some of the others but the first one is you want to take your population that's flowing into the models and you want to reconcile that against something called the general ledger gl and the gl is kind of like the golden rule for the bank of what you uh, match up to, right? So if you have 10 billion on this side, GL says 10 billion, you're good to go. So you you do that, what we call a high level reconciliation there to um, make sure that your population is good. Once your population is good, then you dive into the fields, the variables, the features, those are, these are all names for it, but we call it the critical data elements, CDE. And the CDEs are the variables that are impacting the models and ultimately the downstream processes that flow to the regulatory bodies. And so I came up with a process that does trending on the CDEs and it just various statistics. Um, You got your mean, your max, your min, and then you're also looking at the last 12 months of data and you're looking for any abnormalities in that 12 months and and using a standard deviation of three. And you're looking at the latest month over month variation in comparison to the last 12 months and kind of a, uh, so it's a very rudimentary way of, of kind of gaining confidence in your data. At the end of the day, it's, do you trust your data? Because you could have all these great models, garbage in, garbage out. That's kind of the the model that a lot of people say. So, you know, there's there's definitely better data quality techniques out there, but you have to be able to explain it to um, all of your regulatory, your governing bodies too. 
And, and that's a really important point too, especially for the the banking industry. I, I did a project for a large global bank um, back when I was uh, working big four, and uh, you know, essentially, it was a big project made the made the times uh, you know um, significant deficiency issued by the auditors to the bank which, you know, they couldn't issue a dividend to their shareholders until they, you know, had it, unless they had it resolved by a certain date. So they threw all this money under the sun. It was a hundred million dollars paid to the consulting firm I was working for, you know, and you think like something crazy was, was built and all this technology was implemented. And essentially all they had to do was document the data controls that they have at every hop of the chain. And, you know, and, and it was a bunch of, you know, like low tech uh, solution to this. But, you know, it, it's not only important just to like have these types of controls, like, you know, obviously you want to make sure your data ties out uh, to the source and that it's it's accurate. You know, CFOs are, you know, essentially putting jail time uh, at risk to have this data accurate. So you you have to have it right. But it's not just a matter of having the data right. It's about documenting that the data was right. So in their case, they didn't even get in trouble because, you know, the data was wrong and and somebody siphoned a billion dollars and tried to run away. Like, you know, you think it's like some crazy story when uh, when you hear about it, but it was, you know, they had everything under, they had all the controls in place. They just didn't have a piece of paper that wrote down what those controls at every hop of the data chain was, you know, and we spent seven, eight months just, you know, going, all right, where do you get your data from? You know, okay, where do they get their data from? And just tracing it back, you know, hop by hop. So, you know, an uh, important way to, you know, save time, save money, you know, is making sure that not only are you meeting the regulatory requirements from a, do you have everything in place you need to have, but do you have the appropriate documentation uh, related to it as well? Yeah, so really it's the tactical, you have a tactical and a strategic solution. Um, and often you're trying to solve the tactical because that's that's your timeline. That's what matters at the moment. And so often you get stuck in in solutioning something in the moment that you burn yourself later down the road and it costs you a lot. Um, because you didn't take a little bit of extra time in the moment, or you don't have time in the moment because, you know, whether other external pressures are there, internal pressures are there, are there, you've got to solve the solution and it works for today and you'll worry about tomorrow's problems tomorrow. Um, but you know, those problems can snowball and, and definitely build up over time and ultimately cost you on a on a lot of projects and I see a lot of inefficiency there um, when that does happen. So it's a, it's really a matter of balancing it because of course you can't spend all your time trying to develop a long-term solution. Um, you, ha you have to kind of handle both with limited amount of resources. Yeah. And, and a lot of companies I see, you know, like, you, you know, they always say the, the first rule of whether it's software development, technology implementations, whatever is that, everything takes longer than what you think it's going to take. Right. And, you know, things drag on, whether sometimes it's for good reason that you realize, uh, Hey, here's what's possible now. And you want to just take a little extra time to expand your scope. Sometimes things just take longer than, than you want them to. And, you know, it, it seems like the first thing that always gets cut, you know, when you're running, uh, over time or over budget is the documentation around, around things. So, you know, it, it has a very, low perceived value in terms of, you know, what it offers and, you know, and, and it always comes back to bite everyone that makes that decision, right? Somebody leaves a housing project, someone got hit by a bus literally and, uh, you know, and, and there was nothing out there and, you know, we had to rebuild the system from scratch because nobody could tell us how it worked. Yeah, exactly. Somebody likes to win the lottery. We used to hit the bus win the lottery, but, um, but it, it, it's exactly that. I mean, it's not your fancy um, solution to a lot of problems. You know, a lot of people are looking for something bigger, software or something else. But something as simple as um, creating that documentation there. And even if you bring in other consulting agencies to do that work for you, um, having the right 
it's me or subject matter expert on the project to be able to fulfill the documentation requirements correctly is essential for that product or solution surviving or the sustainability of that project going forward. So I think something as simple as that, and it's always been there, it always gets overlooked because you're doing all the other work. Um, and, and, you know, you've got the, usually, at least from my personal perspective, usually what happens is you have the people that are there that can talk about it. So you don't really need to document it. But in reality, you're going to have turnover. And when you have turnover, pieces of the pillar or stilts of the house start falling out. And sure enough, you're going to be stuck at some point. So that's where documentation can really help you. Yeah. And, and a big problem I see too, especially like in the data science space, right? There's a lot of machine learning going on and, you know, where there are models that you're building out, but essentially the, you know, the models that, that you're building are determining certain factors in terms of, you know, what decisions are going to be made. And, you know, I, I guess something that I see a lot of companies struggle with, definitely want your input on this as well, is how do you ensure that these models don't become just a black box of like, you know, hey, I put data in and this is the decision we should make. And uh, because the model told me that this is the decision that we should make. And, you know, somebody's going and, you know, making a key corporate decision based on something when, you know, the the computer essentially figured out what what it needed to be and you know yeah definitely in the regulatory space you have a lot of um challengers and, and auditing bodies kind of making sure that the variables that you chose coefficient supply the process that you chose all make sense and can be explainable i mean if you look at neural networks you really they're great you know um huge part of the whole machine learning process in today's world, but we can't really use them. We have to still stick to the classical statistical um, modeling methods because those can be explained. And as great as those other methods might be, until we can explain those and understand them, we can't use them because there's a certain risk associated with it, even though they provide probably better results. The, because of the risk of the unknown is there. You have to stick with what you know. And that's a lot more controllable at the end of the day. Um, and then in terms of the data side, it's really an end-to-end -end process. So um, I'm, again, more on the data management um, and data engineering side. Um, and, and so it's crucial to understand the data quality of the critical data elements going into those models. Um, because you can build up the best model, but again, garbage in, garbage out. So it's it's essential. That's why a lot of the controls and um, lineage back to quote unquote true source is a lot of the projects that are going on to really understand that end to end um, solution, because that's what ultimately drives the the number at the end of the day that that drives the whole business decision. So it really starts with uh, a good bit of it, I would say, might be a little biased here, but um, a good bit of it is the data. Um, I would say 70% of your problems, if not more, are going to be on the data side. And I think going forward, especially as the modeling side gets more and more automated, of course, there'll be new techniques there. And there's still a lot of work to do there. But I think understanding the data is going to become more and more important as we move into um, uh, the, the age of AI. Um, I think, you know, everybody's going to be adopting models more, adopting all these algorithms more. So there's going to be a lot of bad data mixed in there that could really cause the trust of in the models or in the process to go down. And so I think it's going to become more and more important to understand your data and how and really metrics on how do you trust the the information that's flowing into your algorithm because you could understand your algorithm but you could totally change that algorithm however you want by feeding it in the data that is good or bad do you see um 
you know, with AI that they're being in some ways less control over, um, you know, the types of data science that's happening where like, can you see like somebody inputs into chat GPT or, you know, whatever the, um, you know, preferred AI tool is and just say, Hey, here's my data, go figure out what, you know, what I need to know based on this. And, you know, the AI is going behind the scenes and, you know, running a bunch of models and saying, all right, this is the model you should use. And, you know, where it's okay, I built it this way, because the AI told me to build it this way versus, you know, we, uh, you know, we went in and purposefully chose this model and this type of algorithm and, and all that. Yeah, you definitely have to um, critique your thought process, critique the models, even as great as chat GPT and some of these, these other large language models are operating and they're getting better by the day. But even so, I think there's going to become an over-reliance upon these processes that will cause biases. Um, and those biases could get exaggerated over time if you don't understand them early on. And so that's where, you know, it's almost like an echo chamber where if you just keep feeding it a certain type of information, you're going to keep, keep going down that route. Um, so that's where I think understanding the data and what you're trying to um, accomplish is, is crucial. Um, and, and I'm all for AI, of course, but it, it's going, I think being the subject matter expert in your area is going to become even more important as time goes along. Um, because these tools will essentially allow empower the subject matter expert like we've never seen before. Yeah, one thing that I've been seeing too is that, you know, you've got a bunch of people that are, oh hey, I'm not a coder, but now I have Chat GPT and it could just go and write some scripts for me, right? And because they don't have the background, you know, do these scripts work sometimes, right? But do you really know what you're getting with it? Um, you know, and it's turned into a, I'm going to try to like cheat my way in terms of skill set of gaining a skill set I don't have versus somebody that has the skill set that knows, you know, how to evaluate the output, how to prompt on the input side to get to the output that you want. You know, that's where AI is being very, is very powerful versus the person that's just like, oh, today I want to be a coder. So chat GPT, go and write a macro for me that does this. And, you know, and then wonder why the output, you know, doesn't, doesn't get them what they want. Or even worse, it gives you output that seems correct and you use it. And in fact, it's giving, or and it gives you an answer that looks like it's correct, but it's, it's truly not. It's actually in a way lying to you. And I think that, that's the scary part about it. Yeah, no, it, it's always important, you know, to validate, to be in a position to validate anything that's going in or out to anything that's, you know, I'm going to call it a black box just because it's, you know, you don't necessarily know what it's doing behind the scenes, um, you know, where you want to make sure that it's, you know, what's coming out is, is the same. I've I've had, you know, AI models do research for me and, and they go and they give me a statistic like 37% of, you know, customers in this demographic face this issue. And you say, okay, can you cite your source? And it says, well, I don't really have a source. This is just based on like what I, what I know. And it's all right. Well, what do you know? Right. Is this something <laughs> that you're going to, um, you know, do you, you read one article and that seemed to tell you something like that, or, you know, you're, you're really seeing trends in this area. You know, it's, it's, it's important. You, you just got to know well and be able to validate anything that you're going to use in any, you know, type of professional environment that, what's coming out is right. And that it's not, you know, you can go and push in a particular use case and get code, but that code might not be dynamic to handle a data set that's slightly different. It might be hard coded to, you know, just that specific use case. And now you go to your boss and you tell them, Hey, I, I have this great model over here that let's go and use this. And he says, all right, use this other data file. And you plug that data file in and it doesn't work, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's really that domain knowledge that will um, will kind of fill in the pieces where the tool 
just helps you out at the moment. It, it'll, it's very interesting to see how it's evolving, though, I think, too, because what it is today, I mean, even what it was two years ago, um, compared to what it is today is vastly different. So um, it'll be interesting to see how the AI landscape becomes more of a SME subject matter expert going forward and and it, probably even the onset of AGI. We'll we'll see. That's those are all interesting pieces in the world we live in. But I'm just glad to be part of the journey. Yeah. No, that, that that's great. And it's you know, it's one of those things I like to kind of explain AI as it, you know, kind of lowers the curve to be able to achieve what you're looking for. It doesn't replace you know, you, you can't just take somebody that's, uh, you know, in one particular industry and make them an expert in another one overnight. It's it's about how do you apply what you're getting. And, you know, now you can act as a higher level where, you know, I use it a lot for like coding, but it's it's something where I know how to code. I know what to tell it in order to get the code output that I'm looking for. I know how to test it to make sure that, you know, it's doing what it's supposed to do. And, you know, in the cases where it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, I know how to tell it, all right, let's do this. But, you know, it just speeds the time because for me to go and figure out, okay, now I have to code in this programming language that I haven't done in, you know, for forever. Someone asked me to write a macro for them. And it had been like two years since I wrote a macro and, and I'm trying to figure out what the syntax for, you know, for visual basic over there for a, for a macro to, to go and write it. And I said, oh, let me just plug this into chat GPT and, you know, gave me the, the output over there. So, you know, it definitely makes things a lot faster, but faster if you are, you know, you don't even have to be an expert in the domain, but just, you know, above average or, you know, un understanding of, of what that is. Exactly. If you conceptually know what you're trying to do, um, it can fill in those missing pieces pretty good right now. So it, it's interesting to see what the creativity aspect of it will be going forward um, and what it can do there. But for right now, I mean, especially um, coming back to what I'm doing and like the area that I'm in, we're not, we're not that kind of blocked off chat GPT and some of those tools from uh, barring it from us actually using it in the workplace. But I think that'll change um, once we understand it better. It's always from a risk perspective. Like, um, are there any, what are the data security implications? Um, you know, and then what can this actually do? It's better to just hold off on it until you understand it and then adopt it rather than adopt it right away. That's generally, that's generally the approach I've seen. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of been my experience in like the banking and, you know, financial services industries too, where um, it's not necessarily a slowness to adopt technologies. It's a, we need to make sure that this kind of fits into the regulatory models that, we have, you know, I know a colleague of mine worked on a, a project uh, for a large bank and they went and turned, created their own machine learning model on whether or not to approve uh, mortgages. And, you know, they, they found that, um, you know, they got in a lot of trouble because the model determined on its own that um, people that lived in a particular uh zip code um, were more likely to default than people in other zip codes. And so it was denying people in that one zip code, uh, you know, or several zip codes uh, automatically just, you know, because they lived in that zip code. And then it turned out that people of a particular race lived in that particular zip code. Um, and they got in trouble because, you know, while they didn't go and code you know, something that was essentially racist into the algorithm. Um, the algorithm discriminated based on, you know, based on a zip code, but inadvert, you know, in indirectly because of race, because of who lives in the zip code. So, you know, you want to make sure that there is that transparency, um, you know, and full like auditability of, you know, if, if key decisions of an organization are being made by a machine, that there's some kind of audit trail of, 
why was this decision made and something that, you know, we could use to either prove or, you know, disprove, you know, anything that, that comes out of that. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I think that um, situations happened a couple of times. So it's, um, it's definitely one that you, you know, it wouldn't fit your policy and the legality of everything going on. So, Although um, it may make sense from a modeling perspective, there's so many other perspectives that you have to consider before adopting it. But um, and so that's why I think, especially from um, the risk and regulatory space that I'm in, we're, we're slower to adopt. I mean, it's it, and again, it's not necessarily slowness. It's it's just the risk adverse or the amount of risk appetite that you have for taking on these new technologies and there's a cost. So that's the other piece to it. So, you know, like it's, it's easier to handle the fundamentals and you need to get the fundamentals like documentation and lineage and those pieces, right. And that's kind of like your ground framework for the next evolution of AI, or next evolution of models and adopting new technology and everything else, you really need to develop a good framework for your base before you move and start taking those next steps. And it's that much harder if you have a merger going on um, and, you know, you have just that much more data to deal with. So it's, it's, um, it's a multi-year process. <laughs> what, um, what kinds of use cases are you seeing that are being like popular in terms of, you know, applying data science to, you know, to particular problems? Like, are there, are there any like kind of key trends or anything that you're kind of seeing in terms of how it's being used in, you know, in financial services? I would say it's mostly in the fraud space. Um, there are some data quality um, projects um with m more some of your more advanced techniques um but data science has such a broad term too um in that you know i think when most people hear data science especially coming out of school you th you automatically think um modeling and building models they don't you don't really see a lot of people focused on the actual the data side of it so, um, but that's actually a 70% of your analytical life cycle. Um, so there's still a lot more focus on, uh, developing frameworks right now, putting controls in, in the right places to allow those data science projects to be successful. Um, at least from where I'm standing and where we're at right now coming out of a large bank merger um there there's a lot of scrutiny right now to just say let's get what we have in place done correctly um and so in terms of the new techniques that are being adopted new technologies being adopted they are happening um but within the cecil ccar a regulatory space it's um it, it's more of a five year two to five year process i would say it, it's um we're sticking with what we have right now but we're, we're adopting more of i think there's some smaller pieces of like if you look at code management for example um before we were managing code you know all in SaaS, and then now we've adopted Git and and Azure and and really that whole process of code management. So that of course happened a while ago for most places. Um, well, that took even within the bank. It happened in some other places earlier, but that took a little while to adopt, be adopted. And really, it wasn't until auditors and controllers came in and said, "Hey, what is your code versioning process? Like, how are you managing?" your code that you had to really come in and, and devise and come up with a, a better solution than what we had previously. So we had kind of a legacy solution where we're using um, Unix to do that. But 
and now kind of adopted a new solution. So that's just one example. It's not a big example, like fully moving to SageMaker or something like that, but uh, it it's small steps. And again, I think it's just really understanding the risk with each step and understanding you're moving a whole organization forward that allows you to eventually be successful. So scalability is a big piece of it. And, and I think that's a big part of it too, because a lot of companies like have the mindset of like, we need to buy this big enterprise product or like we need to do something big in order to like gain efficiency or save money or save time, wh- whatever the, the goal is. Right. And more often than not, you see that it's a lot of these smaller kind of steps, right. That lead to bigger types of gains where you don't necessarily have to go and, you know, spend a million dollars on a, you know, on a system to manage your code. Um, you know, I know the banking industry has been, um, it, it's been a, it, it was a bit of a challenge for a long time to move to something that's cloud-based where, you know, having data outside of your own firewalls and, and systems over there. And I'm sure that, you know, played a, a big factor in like, you know, not having, um, you know, some kind of code management that's most of them are, are cloud hosted, you know, now where if you don't want to go with the cloud, then you're kind of, uh, you know, bottlenecked in terms of, you know, what, what you can do, but there are a lot of big, you know, efficiencies you can gain with, you know, just small investments here and there. Exactly. And it, I mean, at the end of the day, a business comes down to the dollars, right? So if you're spending dollars on something as great as it may be, um, it, it's got to really add value in a like really bring dollars back to the the balance sheet per se before they can really justify it. And it is more challenging with analytical tools to do that because it is a cost at the end of the day that you don't necessarily see a return on directly. Um, but um, you know, I think that's where dealing with what you have is so crucial because you are generally you have a lot of data or a decent amount of data in it and a process in place that can be optimized and making sure that that's built out in a way that can be leveraged for the next step is so crucial. So devising a strategy to build out your current process so that it can take that next step so that when you are ready to spend those dollars, those dollars are spent efficiently. That's a very crucial piece and that, that whole strategic um, point to dealing with what you have is not only going to save you dollars, but it is going to allow you to be a lot more efficient down the road. Sure. And I guess I know we're coming close to the end over here, but um, you know, just uh, I'm, I'm curious, how, how do you look at, um, you know, like an ROI on, certain initiatives like i know that there's um often it's uh um i think i referred to it in a past episode as it's uh, they're fake numbers where it's you know oh hey here's the efficiency you gain right and it's not sometimes you don't see that efficiency because the efficiency calculation is well you could fire 10 people because you went and did this and the company's not going to just go out and fire the 10 people. They, they repurpose them to other things or whatever, or, you know, ROI is a calculated with an assumption of, well, you don't have to hire five more people to do it. And it's, well, we weren't going to anyway, because, you know, we just had our, our five analysts work uh, nights and weekends to, to do this. <laughs> and so that, that's yeah. been our, our solution, right? So like, you know, when, when you're going and looking at, you know, what, is the ROI on some of the initiatives? Like what, what are you looking at? Um, you know, specifically. So really we're looking at, I think what, how well, I I think a big metric is how well can you trace your data back? Like uh, that, that's a huge initiative right now in terms of understanding, I think to all the other pieces, understanding what are you what are you documenting at the end of the day like what is your end-to-end process um so everything is kind of tied around that in terms of all the investments and everything else so 
the I think the the ROI on that's really going to be the ability to trust the process better going forward. Um, and you would think, well, y- you already have some level of trust in it already, but the margin of error is so small. Um, and the fact that you have to get it right is essential that you always have to keep focusing on that. So you always keep investing dollars and your return on investment is going to be that trust factor. I think at the end of the day, um, and just a lot building that process to take on more risk, I think in the future, um, because once you can gain a certain amount of trust, you're, you're able to increase your risk appetite there. But that's the basis of it all is trust. That's what I. No, that's great. So, you know, my key takeaway from that is it's not necessarily a 30% ROI, this, that. It's about establish what's your goal. You know, what are you trying to accomplish? And then does this initiative get you better at that type of goal? And it could be a numerical thing in terms of a cost savings. It could be a data quality of, you know, we went and went from, 80% trust in our data to 90% trust in our data, you know, to a hundred percent trust in our data. And that's kind of justified that this is why we did this initiative versus that one. Exactly. Yeah. There's, there's so much external scrutiny um, that drives a lot of it also um, to, to, to your, to at least from my perspective, our initiatives as well. So you, it, it ultimately, that's why that trust factor is kind of prioritized over everything else, because that's um, that's ultimately how everybody aligns at the end of the day. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, and I know we're uh, we're about out of time over here. So, uh, you know, just wanted to remind our, our viewers over there to make sure that, you know, you like, comment, subscribe to our channel. We want to get more great guests like Jeremy on the show over here. Jeremy, we really appreciate um, you coming on and, you know, sharing uh, all the insights that um, yes. that you have over here. Well, thanks for having me, Daniel. Yeah. And, and if, uh, if our audience wants to get in touch with you, it's the best way for them to reach out, connect on LinkedIn, or do you have, um, you know, other preferred contact method? Yes. LinkedIn would be the best way. Um, yeah. Um, you can just search my name and I'm there. Social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll put the information in the description here so that they could just click a link rather than um, you know uh, searching around. But uh, really appreciate having you on uh, again, Jeremy. And you know we'd love to uh, have you back on at at some point yes. to you know kind of go through and follow all the you know amazing things that you're working on. Definitely, it'll probably change a lot. Yeah, <laughs> the world is always evolving, especially in the AI world. So. Really excited. Thanks for having me. Really enjoyed this.